Good morning, folks. Hopefully, I have audio here. Good morning, good morning, good morning. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Here, IDPA Montana is in the house. I am a little bit behind. Well, not too far behind, man. That spring is stiff. Good morning, live stream viewers on the Facebook. Hey, Chris is uh, in Las Vegas. Good morning, Chris in Vegas, IDPA. Of course, uh, we'll have a few more people on. Looks like we have about 15 live on right now. I am running a minute behind. I apologize. If you'll have a good uh, video and audio, give me a thumbs up. Looks like we do. Hey, John is on from Yukon. Don2270. I love all the coin members that just jump on here, man. We have a culture there, a society. I am getting my stuff scored away. I have too much stuff on my live stream table. By the way, this hopefully this will be one of the last live streams I do in my office. In the very near future, I hope to be doing live streams in the live fire studio. Uh, I probably could have done one this morning, but um, it's hectic over there, right? Good morning, Frank. How are you? Hey, Bryant, Arkansas. David, David Waller. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you as well. Gerald from Oregon. Man, it is. Oh, God, it's 5.30 in Oregon right now. Good morning in Oregon. A lot of crazy stuff going on there. Chris and IDPA, one and the same. Good morning, good morning. All right, sorry for the runny nose. I just had to go outside to my Connex box and get a bunch more lights, and I got a couple um, examples. I talked to you about showing some lights off today uh, that I use that are ID, IDPA specific. I'll show you a neat little trick here in a second. But, of course, good morning, folks. My name is Mike Seeklander, and uh, I am going to be your tour guide today for the live stream. Of course, we're talking about low light, and the specific subject today is kind of the search, engage, defend continuum, right? And, and if you watched last week's live stream or any of my low light live streams, you know that when I'm talking about low light, we're talking about a situation where you have less light than you want to, and you need to use an artificial light to search, defend, engage, and do all the things you're doing. So that's what we're talking about today, of course. Um, nothing happens without safety. So please uh, be willing to comply with all safety rules. Make sure that your firearms or any firearm you might handle is in fact unloaded. Of course, I have a few guns here. I've got guns literally all over my desk. I've got one of my safe guns. This is my EDC X9 unloaded. Nothing in the chamber. Good to go there. I have a Wilson Combat Glock 19 with a cool fire barrel. By the way, that red barrel and that kind of nipple on the front tells you that that's a cool fire conversion kit. So that's a cool fire conversion kit. You can check them out at coolfiretrainers.com or coolfiretrainer.com. I have another one of my safe guns. This is the old school Glock 22 that I had in one of my desk safes for the longest time. And I got this bad boy out because I wanted to talk real briefly about weapon mounted lights. And I've got a light activation switch on that one. Uh, I've got another beautiful gun here, a little compact Wilson Combat. This is a CQB compact, originally made for the bug division in IDPA before the bug division rules changed. So this is one of the guns I used to shoot. Uh, in the backup gun match, national match in, uh, where was that? Uh, Massachusetts, I guess, back in the day. Anyways, that guy is unloaded and clear. And I gotta, man, I got I to gotta get my clean on with some of these guns. I actually got a, a one of my 1911s, 1911s out the other day, one of my 45s. It had a beautiful 45 that Wilson Combat built for me last year, and I had used it to practice a ton for the single stack nationals, and I shot 45. Of course, normally when I compete with uh, single stack, I shoot 40, but I shot 45 because I had a bunch of it uh, just to train for the match. And apparently I didn't do a great job of cleaning that gun when I was done and it was pretty nasty. So anyways, all right, we have all kinds of folks on. Daniel's on. Richard Schlarb is on. Good morning. Gil is on. Navin is on. Good morning. Hey, do me a favor. Um, if you haven't, do me a favor and click the share button throw this sucker up in the groups. I didn't actually pre-announce this, so I didn't tell anybody we were on today. So I figured, hey, whoever jumps on organically, jumps on organically. Uh, one thing that we found recently is if you don't want to share it, just click the like button. So all of you right now, all 34 of you, click that like button. 
the heart or the little like thumbs up, and that will tell Facebook to say, hey, uh, maybe this is some good stuff. By the way, good morning, Steve Miller. I see you on as well. Um, Joseph Labavia, good morning, Joseph. Hmm. And happy holidays. Hopefully everybody had a happy Thanksgiving and is about to have a happy Merry Christmas, right? Hopefully everybody's doing great. So, all right. So uh, while you're clicking the share button, we're going to talk about this real briefly. Um, by the way, I did talk a little bit or not a little bit, quite a bit about weapon mounted lights, right? So one of the, the discussions that we had last week was the fact that if you have a weapon mounted light, it's truly an equalizer in terms of, for example, a full size home defense gun. And a lot of you that have been following me for a long time know that my full size or my home defense type guns, ones that I won't carry on a regular basis, uh, are probably a similar frame than those that I train with and carry on a regular basis. But it's probably a full size gun or close to full size gun instead of a compact firearm. And in all of my gun safes, my home defense firearms probably have a weapon mounted light of some sort or configuration. In this case, this is a weapon mounted light and laser configuration. And my strong preference, if I have it, and if, if they make it for the model that I'm utilizing, is a weapon mounted light with a light and laser combo and a grip activation switch. We talked about the utility of the grip activation switch last week and in, in that I can grip the handgun and fire it. So there's not a lot of thought process or training that goes into it. I simply grip the gun like I always grip the gun and fire the gun. Whether that's with my strong hand or my support hand or with two hands, I simply grip the gun and fire. I can also compress the gun and shoot from close quarters positions and stuff like that. So we talked about that a little bit. If you have questions about um, the weapon mount of light process or the weapon mount of light selection, please let me know. I did bring on, just briefly, uh, I have a couple of these left over. I'll probably put these on some guns eventually. You know, this is an example of a, a light and laser guard. This is a Streamlight System TLR6 made for 1911. It's got a light and a laser, very, very light, very, very compact. And, of course, back in the day, I used to carry a uh, Smith & Wesson uh, shield with a light guard pro. Maybe it's laser guard pro. I get those two confused, made by Crimson Tray. So both good companies, good products. Uh, I have a variety of stuff out here. Right now in my pocket, I'm carrying a Surefire a stiletto. I don't have a, a, a sponsorship or true uh, relationship with any of these companies. They're all good companies. Uh, some of the products I have are free products they've given me for t and &E and evaluation and, and use and live streams like this. And then some stuff I, I purchased myself. Okay. Um, so um, we're going to talk real briefly about a few things. And I want to address the process of what your low light system should do. And I want to talk maybe real briefly about the things I think you should practice. Um, and by the way, uh, oh, and Gilly said that he was surprised that Facebook informed uh, me that you have a show today. Well, that's cool. Well, the Facebook is being friendly. Maybe the maybe the Facebook is being holiday friendly to my C-Clan and actually showing off my live streams. Back in the day, if they were truly not, uh, what do they call those, the filter sensor? I think that's the new term for the social media sensor. They put a filter sensor on so they don't show you to many people. They only show you to people that are your biggest fans. Um, because if I were teaching a class about, I don't know, something silly, uh, there, there would be 600 live stream viewers on route. Hey, by the way, just some trivia, not to talk and chat a lot. Um, to, some trivia for you. How, I've kind of figured it out. How many live streams, how many free live streams to those of you that have been watching me for a long time, or maybe that are new to this live stream, think I've done over the past, let's say, six or seven years? How many total live streams? And I've, I've figured out roughly what I think the number to be. Um, if you had to guess, throw a number up in the comments. Just type a number up there if, if you could. How many total live streams have I done, let's say, over six years? I think I started them about six years ago. Some of you that are on right now were there uh, in the beginnings. And then we're going to talk about we're talk, going to talk about the Surefire Stiletto that I'm using. And we're going to talk about the search process. And I also want to use an iron sighted or a, a non optic sighted handgun to talk about the one handed position I, I use in low light. Uh, Todd says 275. No, that's way low, Todd. Definitely more than that. Frank says 350. Getting closer, Frank. I think it's upwards of 350 or more. Richard says 250. No, nope, I don't know about that. Hmm. Peter says over 350. That's probably a good guess since I uh, said it was upwards. Will says 397. Yeah. 
Uh, Gilly, I think you're probably closest right now, probably closer to 500. Because, um, for example, the initial live streams that I did for many weeks on end were one a day. I did them five days a week. And then I cut those down to two to three days a week for a long time, for a couple of years, right? So if I did two, two a week and I, I missed two weeks a year, that would have been 100 live streams for those couple of years. So that maybe if I did that for three years, that would have been at least, right, um, three to 400 live streams. And then the rest of the years, let's say I did 52 in a year on average, maybe more. So probably closer to 500. I don't know if, if Chris says 600. Doug says 600. I don't think I've hit 600, but who knows? I might have hit 600. Hey, Tina. Good morning, Tina. Looks like you shared with uh, Girls of the Low Country and a Girl and Gun, uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. By the way, if you are on Live Fire, the app that I am part of now, that I don't own, but I'm part of, that's going big time. We just got the studio finished. I'd love to see you on, especially if you're part of the Girls with Guns groups. We're talking about potentially a pretty special deal for some of you uh, lady female shooters to, to get you more involved and help out with those processes. Because I love those those groups, by the way. I think that's super important, by the way. Gilly, you're probably pretty darn close, man. You're probably close to 550. That's what I'm estimating, about 550, give or take. 500 plus to 550. Okay, so let, let's talk about this real quick. Um, so uh, get your notepad out and think about this uh, for a second. And I want you to... to um, in terms of low light, I want you to embrace the fact that the single best thing you can do um, in addition to working on specific techniques to practice your low light continuum. And let's let's talk about what the, con the continuum is. I'm using that fancy word because it's kind of cool. My continuum has to be my ability to search the area with my light. I need to be able to find a threat, right? Uh, number two. I want to have the ability, if I'm searching and I need to use uh, some sort of physical contact, whether someone throws a punch at my face or swings some, something at my head, I want to be able to use my arm to cover my head, right? We call this a half cage, right? Uh, this is another modif uh, modification or version of the half cage, but I want to be able to get my hand up in front of my head or my neck area. I want some structure up here to protect my head. Uh, in, in that circumstance, I want to have the ability to throw a strike, right? To throw a punch, to use the light and the, the striking ability very, very quickly. Um, I want to have the ability, if I identify a, a threat, to engage. We'll talk about why I use the one-handed eye index technique and why I'm not using a two-handed technique. That's one of the primary things I want to talk about today, right? And then, of course, maybe um, take my hand and use it to pull a uh, loved one out of the way or do different things. So my low light system or continuum, right, has to offer these different things. Now, um, first of all, let's talk just briefly about the, the search process. How would I in, handle searching an area? Um, and full disclosure here, the, the techniques that I'm talking about are singleton, you know, single person, search techniques that are my preference that um, may or may not make sense for some of you, uh, but they're things that I've found that work for me in testing this against multiple role players. And let me let me tell you what I used to do. Back in the day, um, sorry, I got a runny nose again this morning. I would have a low light block of instruction and a good portion of that block of instruction was the rain shooting, right? So we talk about light lumens and illumination, light types and stuff. Then we practice some, you know, just some one-handed shooting. We would let students experiment with some two-handed positions. And then eventually, after the live fire portion was over, we would get plastic red guns out or blue guns, right? And we would go into the building that I worked at, and we would put a role player hidden in the building. Now, the role player could do a, ver a variety of things. They could either just pop out from, you know, the middle of nowhere. Uh, they could be in, like, a closet or a close corner, uh, where when the shooter came, you know, into that position, uh, they might swing up, you know, we had, used to have a foam baseball bat and stuff at them, uh, or would have an actual firearm or a weapon like a knife in their hand. And the, the shooters, the good guy's job was to use their light and search through the, the building and find the person before they got too close to them uh, or engage them if they were armed. And I learned, I learned more from that process 
about low light stuff than I have from anything else I've ever done. Uh, it's literally free and it's just fantastic in terms of learning to do some things. Now, you got to have a well trained role player. You have to have someone you're going to trust because if, if you have someone that's going to be trying to knock your head off with a baseball bat, like use, use intelligence if you do this, you know, get some of those. Um, those, those center things from paper towel rolls and put some tape on them and make a fake bat and give them a fake knife, you know, something rubber, you know, no live weapons, of course, at all, only, you know, blue guns, red guns, plastic guns, or whatever else. Uh, you could use uh, certain variations, just be mindful of the laser that comes out of the front of the gun, right? And practice that, okay? So here's, here's what I've generally found. I'm going to back away from the camera a little bit. So Bear with me in terms of sound. The first thing I want to show you is how I might negotiate a room. And this is just kind of a rough idea of what I'm thinking and what I'm doing, okay? Um, now, uh, in this doorway, for example, let's say I was entering this doorway. And if you have questions, just hold it for a second. Uh, the, if this is a room I'm going into, right? But let me let me back up a little bit. Number one, let's, let's talk principles first. When I'm moving around, and by the way, if you're just joining me this morning, I got a bunch of people on. I should have said hi to you. Uh, hey, Jack Neat, good morning. I see you on Live Fire, by the way, Jack Neat, on a regular basis, posting your hard work. Alex, good morning, sir. How are you? Sandra, Chattanooga, good morning. How are you? How are you? Uh, all right, we got a few more people out there. Nice. Okay, we're talking low light this morning, shipping on. So here we go. Principle number one where do I put my gun? So, for example, if I'm entering a room or in my home and I'm searching, I'm not searching with the gun out here, right? I'm never placing the firearm in a position where it's going to occlude my vision, where it's going to cover up my vision, or it's, it's grabbable or it's reachable. So, for me, principle number one is when I'm searching, I'm actually going to retract the firearm to a relatively protected position, right? So, when I'm searching, I've got the gun at a close quarter position. It's not quite the full high pectoral index point that Craig Douglas teaches, right? Uh, but it's retracted, certainly, so I can protect it. I can retract it farther and shoot from here if I needed to, right? Or I can extend the handgun and shoot from the one-handed position that I like the most. And we'll talk about that in a second. But when I'm searching, I'm retracting the gun, and I'm getting the light out ahead of my vision and eyes. And I'm searching, you know, in corners and under furniture, and I'm letting the light lead the way. Oftentimes when I walk into a room, my search technique is to, to come in and illuminate low, right? So I'm going to do a quick wash of the light. I call that washing the light. And what I'm doing there is I'm washing the light and I'm bouncing it into the room, right? I'm trying to illuminate the corners of the room. Now understand that if, if this were a room, right, you can see the doorway, that little area is where I have my safe and stuff in my house. If that were a room, before I would ever enter the room, I would, you know, use a pie slicing technique. And I would try to get as much of my light and search into the room as possible, maybe utilizing the edge of the door frame, right? The edge of the door frame for cover. So before I ever got into that room, before I ever entered that room, I would have illuminated in the room and seen as much as I possibly could. Now, uh, one thing we don't talk about a lot is if I could have snuck up to this room, right, and I know my house, and maybe I'm searching and I think someone's out there, I might literally do that. Right. Turn the light switch on. Right. Um, a lot of the low light stuff that I'm talking about here. May be a little bit contrived. Right. Because if you have the ability and you have multiple position light switches or motion activated lights in your outer perimeter, like I do, a lot of the stuff becomes kind of, you know, a, a moot point, mute point. Right. Because. Those lights are going to be activating or I'm going to be turning the light switches on, right? But let's say I'm in a circumstance where maybe I'm out near my Connex or you're in a house and now there's no power. Maybe the power got shut off or cut the power. Maybe you're searching a warehouse 
uh, your big warehouse where you have all of your equipment and you've got doorways. My point there is before I ever enter this room, right, I'm shining the light in. I'm doing as much of the search as possible without ever committing to the room itself, okay? Now, and good morning for Camp Lejeune, CJ Patriotic. Good morning, Camp Lejeune. I'd love to see that on this morning. Maybe Marine there, huh? Um, so let's talk about the entry into the room itself. If I'm entering, let's say this is the room. When I come through this doorway, I'm going to pick a direction left or I'm going to pick a direction right, right? So the moment I enter the doorway, I'm going to be washing, and then the light's going to go off, and I'm going to get out of the doorway, right? Because more than likely, if there's any light in the doorway behind me, and by the way, this is all in my low-light program. I talk about it in a in the very small book I have, and there's some DVDs out there. Uh, if you're an AWS Quid member, you can watch this. But what I don't, I don't want to do is I don't want to stay in that doorway very long because I'm backlit, right? So I'll come into the room and pick left or pick right. When I come into the light in the room, I'm doing a wash of the light, and I'm moving left or right, and the light goes off. Light on, search, light off, move. Light on, search, light off, move. Now, if during the wash of my light, I caught someone, let's say the camera is the, the, a person, I'm immediately transitioning to put the light in the eyes, just like I did with the camera there for a second. I want to blind that person, and I want to gain that two or three seconds in time to make a decision to give them verbal commands uh, or maybe engage or whatever else. Okay, let's see what we have on by the way this morning. Hey, if you haven't clicked the share button, 41 people on this morning. Live streams have kind of been low numbers lately. I'm not sure if maybe that's the Facebook or who knows. Hmm. And we'll talk more about searching here in a second. Good morning, Archie Curry from Calgary, Albert. I must be Canada. Minus 34. Holy moly. My gosh, that's crazy. Doug asked about the water in Camp Lejeune. Hopefully the water's good. Hopefully the water was good when I was there. I was there after that theory was bad. Good morning, Nick Higgins. How are you? Nice to see you on. Okay. Hey, all right. Click the share button. Click the like button. We'll talk a little bit more about this. So we just talked about the fact that when I enter the room, I pick left or I pick right. So I enter, wash, light off, make a decision. When I say make a decision, it would be dictated by what I see. Now, I may very well, if I didn't see what I need to see, I may keep the light on for a second, right? The, the point there is, if there's someone in that room that is going to aggress me, attack me, they know I'm there. I can't really hide. So I really want to use the light to my advantage to find them and to blind them. So there's your little saying of the day. Use the light to your advantage to find them and blind them, okay? Now, I may go from this position where I would give commands, hey, you, stop, show me your hands, get on the ground, whatever. Or I may transition to the one-handed eye index technique. And notice, I do call this an eye index technique because the light is up near my eye. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, Mike, and you've heard this before. Well, if you put the light near your head, um, aren't they going to shoot the light? Yes, they certainly are. But there, there are really no places you could put the light, right, in a low light type technique that their light is not going to be near your face because you're illuminating the sighting system of the fire itself. So don't, don't even pretend to try to not get engaged if someone has a firearm based on where you put the light. The only alternative that might work for that would be, you know, an offset type tactic, right? I think the FBI used to teach something like this years ago, right? Where the light is out here to the side, in which case maybe they would engage the light over here. But it's you're going to find if you try this on a range, it's very difficult to put that together, right? Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't use a sneaky tactic like that or search tactic or engage tactic, but generally speaking, find them with the light, blind them, and engage if you need to engage, okay? One more thing about doorways. And uh, good morning, Sarah. How are you? Watching with gunslinging mamas. We got some gunslinging mamas on this morning. I love that, gunslinging mamas. All right, so um, in terms of this doorway, one more thing that I will do, this is my preference, uh, is if I'm entering a closer space, right, 
So let me get closer to the camera, the microphone. But let's say I'm in that doorway or I'm walking through that door and there's corners to the left or right. So there's, there's a chance that when I enter that closed space, there's someone that's going to be very close to me. Once again, don't forget the principle of the gun. I will have retracted the gun to the full retracted position. And you may notice when I'm doing this, a couple things we've not talked about in the live streams. My muzzle direction is slightly down because what I want to have is I want to have the ability maybe to strike someone in the face, right, that's jumping on top of me or swinging a club at me and pull the trigger at the same time. If the gun is oriented up, I start to point the gun more toward where my hand would be as I'm pushing someone off me or striking them. So yes, the muzzle direction is down. Understand that this high pectoral index technique is a lower hit position, right? I am purposefully targeting the pelvis and the lower abdomen, right? Versus the high center chest because the other hand is probably up in the high center chest area, okay? Now, let's talk about that doorway. If I come through a close space, my handgun is going to be retracted, and I'm going to go from my normal search position with the light. I'm going to bring my light up here, right? So as I enter that doorway, I may do something like this, right? The reason I'm doing this, I'll turn the light off for you, is when I come to that doorway, I'm trying not to occlude my vision, but I'm getting my arm in a position where I could use both the arm itself and structure to keep someone off me, right? And I could also use that light to prevent that full power punch, hopefully, from hitting me directly in the face, or maybe that bat, right? Didn't know I had this, did you? Boom! That bat from being swung and hitting me in the head. I want to use the structure of my forearm, that kind of hurts, right, to prevent that from happening. Now, will it still significantly injure my arm or whatever else? Yes, it probably will but it's better than my head. Even though I have a pretty hard head, I prefer that. So my position there is going to be going to do from this, right? When I come to the door, I'm going to go a little tighter. And I may illuminate like this, right? I'm going to bring that hand and arm up so I can protect my head, right? And when I come back to the doorway, I come back down and I start to wash the light in the room. And then the last thing I want you to think about is building the one-handed position. Now, let's talk about the eye index position, and then we'll do some Q&A. Uh, back in the day, and I'm going to switch to a different firearm. Got an unloaded and clear Wilson Combat CQB here, right? Because I want you to see how this relates to illuminating the sights. Back in the day, when I used to work for the Air Marshals, we taught a, a chin or a neck index technique, right? We had I, I don't know where it had come from. But our low light index technique was this, right? The problem with this, and I want you to pay attention to the shadow, right? Is hopefully you can see on the camera. Yeah. When, when you do this around the neck area, you can see the shadow from my gun. Two things that are not happening. Number one, I'm not illuminating the sights like I want to. And that shadow, believe it or not, right there. Uh, with someone that's five or six or seven yards away is actually covering up the center mass of the person and oftentimes their hands. So that shadow is preventing me from seeing as much as I want to see in terms of what their hands have in them. And number two, I don't really illuminate my sights. Now, when I take that gun, excuse me, the light, right, and I move it from the neck index to the eye index, the shadow drops, right? And I illuminate, you can see this, I illuminate my sights very clearly. So when I was practicing this, I was actually getting ready for a low light match of some sort. And I was really working on, I was shooting an iron sighted limited gun. And I was really working on getting a good position, right, where I could illuminate the sights and aim the gun better. And I found that this position, too low by the neck, washes a bunch of light into the hand and causes that shadow. And believe it or not, a lot of that light bounces back and washes into your face. So that's when I started taking the light and indexing right around my eye. And then I could turn my head, and wherever I turned my head, it was a natural position for the light. And I know, I know, if, if you're just jumping on the live stream, I'm putting a light near my head. But keep in mind, you know, 
Uh, this is the the Harry's technique, right? So he basically took the backs of the backs of his hands and put them together. Michael Harry's former Marine. Um, the, the, let's talk about this real quickly, and then we'll open up for some Q and A. If I am using a two handed technique, right? The reason I would use a two handed technique is because I want some additional stability and recoil control of the firearm. I really don't have additional stability with the Harry's technique. Maybe a little bit, but I don't have any additional recoil control. The downside to the Harry's technique, uh, or I'll switch to different light here, the Rogers technique, where I call this the modified grip, which is a good technique for IDPA matches, but it's not a good technique for me to search, right? So if I'm searching like this, I can engage, but I have a real hard time defending my head, right? I would have to take the hand off and try to cover my head up or strike with it. I don't like those. So all of these two-handed techniques still expose, the light is still near my face and my body, right? Whether or not it's an eye index technique or the light is here, it doesn't really matter to me. The light is still up near me. So if someone is going to shoot at the light, they're going to shoot at the light. They're, they know I'm there. You know, I, I, there's no hiding at that point in time. I want to dominate them with the, you know, the, the band with the lumens of the light and <clears throat> use good tactics, okay? But the, the, the different two-handed positions, when people teach those and do those, I think they're only thinking about slow fire or slower fire accurate shots. It does feel a little more stable when you do this, but the real truth is you don't have any more recoil control with the Harry's technique. You do have more recoil control and stability with the Rogers technique, which is basically a modification. For me, uh, uh, Bill Rogers used to teach a compression of this, the, the basically the button with the, the palm of the hand. For me, I turn the light on and I leave the light on. This is how I shoot an IDPA stage, right? I index just like this, and this is a very accurate position. I can shoot boom, 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 boom. And that light is in a position where it illuminates all of the things I need to. It's an IDPA competitive position, but it's not a great defendant position to search with, to strike with, to protect my head with. And remember, if you're searching your house for low light uh, circumstances, you know, that's a problem. And by the way, I, I did tell you I would do this and show this off. My Wilson Combat teammates would probably be disappointed that I showed this little secret off. But that's how they're setting up. Some of the guys are setting up their light, right? Took a little washer, some tape here, right? Uh, and then I could hold it in my hand. Previous to the stage, I turn the light on, boop, and I shoot, boom, 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 boom. I can do my reloads. The light stays in this position. Some folks like to put the light, turn the light off for you, put it there. I like to put it there, and I push down on the back of the light to illuminate. I think Mr. Frank has a low light uh, coming up, right? So that's my position. Okay, all right, let's do some q and I I don't have a lot more time, folks. Oh, uh, by the way, hey, Sheila McKinney, good morning. Merry Christmas to you as well. Hey, Rudy, Mr. Dry Fire Man, good morning, Rudy. How are you? Gilly, what is my recommended luminance? Good, good question. So this is the Surefire Stiletto um, sent to me by Surefire. Uh, Andy Stanford over there. Andy Stanford, Stanford. Sorry, Andy, if I got your last name wrong. Uh, dude re reached out to me, invited me to one of his conferences, sent me a bunch of lights. I'm very appreciative. Love the guy. Uh, he wrote some material, great books later on. Um, Surgical Speech, you can think, is his primary book. But anyway, he works for Surefire. Sent me this. I love this light. Uh, for years, I carried a MicroStream or a ProTac 1 or 2. I like them, but they're thick. Notice how that is thin by design. Uh, it's got a, a temporary activation switch here. But I can also use it to um, turn on different brightnesses, right? So if I want to work on something, I can turn on. Oh, I can do that kind of stuff, right? Uh, as far as lumens, uh, Gilly, uh, 200 plus is plenty fine. When we get into the five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 lumen lights in a true dark situation, when you come in and you illuminate that light, that hot spot will literally wash back into your face and make it difficult to see. Um, the lumens, it, you know, it's like firearm selection. What's the right gun? It really depends, you know. Um, you know, Mr. Will Parker is up in Montana right now. He's got an extended yard he may have to search, 
So maybe something with 800 lumens makes sense for him in most cases. Where some guy living in an apartment, you know, a good solid two to 300 lumen light is plenty bright. Now for me, um, we could probably see this. That's got a little bit more concentrated beam. Okay, and I, by the way, I don't like all this kind of like that. I don't want to, I don't do that stuff. I just do this, right? Uh, I do like the fact that you can cycle through the stream lights and you can go to the low, right? But I, for a true defensive light, I leave it on one setting. Like this is on one setting. But I do like a little bit more of a throw, a wider throw. When you enter a room, it illuminates everything in front of you. Uh, and that's important for me uh, as well to, to find the threat. Um, okay. Yeah, Chris is hacking her flashlight right now. All right, let me see here. Uh, Chris, how often do you train these low light techniques? Good Good question. Uh, low light, you know, um, it's kind of like everything else. Once you have a, a base of skill, you're pretty solid. Uh, I do a, a lot of, not a lot of dry fire. I do some dry fire stuff with low light where I'll grab my cert pistol and I'll search. Here, here's what I would recommend. Uh, if you don't have, uh, if you haven't shot live fire with low light, find a place you can do so. And if you look at my low light program, there's a series of drills. One of them is simply just indexing and firing the gun, learning how to index, illuminate, and fire the gun, two or three shots at a time, right? And then maybe <clears throat> you put the light in your pocket and you work on deploying the light, drawing your handgun, and then firing a couple shots. So you could keep it simple like that. Uh, and of course, you know, when I'm when I'm practicing low light, I have an indoor range where I can turn the light off. So this winter, I will actually do low light, maybe once every couple of weeks, I'll turn the lights off, right? If I sign up for Frank's match, which I'm supposed to, by the way, which is in South Carolina, if you want to come shoot it with me, Frank will probably post a sign up for him maybe. But anyways, um, when I'm in the, that range, I'll work on a lot of things. I'll just work on shooting, right? Boom, 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 right? And I'll, I'll, I'll work on, man, if I need to scan and how do I really start to use the light? And the last thing I do, which is something I recommend, I recommended in the beginning of this live stream, just have your family member hide. You, uh, give them a blue gun or you know a, a foam baseball bat or something. Set some protocols. No live firearms. No live weapons. And practice searching your environment. Learn where your light switches are. Learn where your corners are. Learn where you can illuminate. You know the, the door frame corner where that light will bounce in there, and you'll see if there's a foot there or there's a person there. Search your house and figure out a way to search your house in a manner where. There's no way someone could be in that that space without you knowing that, right? Um, so there you go. Um, let's see what else I have here. Oh, good morning, Alan Kelly. Nice to see you. Amanda, uh, is it Ananda Beeson? Ananda. Ananda. All right. Um, what else do I have? I'm going to check, make sure I don't have any missed questions here. Okay, folks. Gilly says, I like the technique you showed us, the one near above the, yeah, that, that's the one, one handed eye index technique. Mm. Good morning, Lance Breeden. How are you, sir? All right. So if you have any questions about low light, please throw them up there now. Um, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about the weapon on the light. Uh, we talked about the search positions, right? In terms of where the light is, where the gun is. We talked about how I might consider entering a room. Enter, wash the light, move left or right, light goes off, look, listen. If you get in that position, you walk into the room, you wash the light, you move left, but you find a threat, illuminate them with the light, get the light in their eyes, and then make a decision to engage or give commands, right? Um, use the light to your advantage. I try to get that habit in, in, uh, in students' minds. One of the things that I do is, and try this with your, try this with a loved one. That's a fun trick. So you got to have a light with pretty high lumens. Um, and then what I want you to do is say, okay, here's, we're going to play a game and it's got to be low light. It's going to be kind of a somewhat dark room. So here, here's the game we're going to play. I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to let you pop my hand. So you start putting your hand up and they're popping your hand, right? You put your hand up, they're popping your hand. Put your hand up, popping the hand. And as they're popping your hand, you keep moving your hand to different spots. You do, boom, you do that. And then put your hand up. And they'll go, and then seconds later, they'll finally be able to reach out there. 
The point is they can't react because the light completely overwhelms the visual system in their brain. They can't see anything. They can't do anything. They can't react. And it's those three or four seconds of time that we want, right, uh, in order to make that decision whether or not we're going to engage or move or create distance or run out of the room if maybe maybe this guy's three times your size and, you know, you don't want to fight him. Uh, so think about utilizing the light um, as a weapon itself, right? Um, so uh, Alan asks, uh, iron sights or red, uh, red dot? It, Alan, it doesn't matter. We did talk about this last week. I will tell you, uh, for those that are just joining, if, if I'm using iron sights, I, I have to have the right flashlight position, right? So when I'm talking about that eye index, the, the flashlight is in a spot where it illuminates the sights clearly. If the light is too low, it starts to wash a shadow up on the wall, right? Okay. Now, if you are using a red dot, one thing you have to test, and two things, if it has an auto setting that adjusts the dot for light, turn that off. Turn it to manual. Turn it to bright. Because what you don't want is you don't want your optic sensing the light and then turning down your dot and doing some funky stuff like that. But what you want to do is turn your dot on. Okay, I can see my dot right now, and then go to your shooting position and see if that light over illuminates the window of the optic itself uh, or not. In this case, I can shoot you know, just as clearly with the dot on right now as I can see with the light off. So the dot doesn't change much. The dot is at a brightest intensity where it's not an issue. But make sure there's no reflection or issues when that light you know, illuminates the back of the optic. But once again, they're, they're just different sighting systems, so there's no there's no one way or there's no right or wrong. Okay. Oh, Nick Higgins, fantastic question. So this particular flashlight gun, excuse me, has a night sight. Got a little fuzz on that bad boy. Uh, front sight, right? Uh, my current carry gun, it's not in this room right now, uh, doesn't have night sights. This doesn't have night sights. It has a fiber optic front sight. Um, no night sights, right? The reason I don't care as much about night sights, and I'm not saying they're wrong if you have them, is in order for the night sights to be glowing, right, illuminated enough where you can see them, it has to be a certain level of darkness. That level of darkness is such that if it's that dark, you need a light, either a weapon-mounted light or a handheld light to illuminate, to both find and identify and engage the threat. The second you turn the light on, the night sights become useless, meaning they're not really relevant to me. So I would much rather have a carry gun with a fiber optic front sight that I can see in lit conditions, daylight, cloudy conditions faster, by the way, in, in those circumstances where we're much more likely to get into a fight than put night sights on that become irrelevant because I'm going to be using a handheld light anyway. So to me, they're not even a necessary tool necessarily. Now, if you got night sights on your handgun, okay, that's fine. I'm not poo-pooing on them. I'm just saying I don't think they're very necessary, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, so is it Ananda Beeson or is it Amanda? And that's spelled wrong in her profile. Maybe it's Ananda combo. I don't know. Try not to mispronounce that name. Uh, handheld over a weapon mono light. So uh, if you missed last week's live stream, my my safe guns, my gun safe guns are all going to have full-time light laser combinations that I will literally probably turn on and leave on unless I have a grip activation system, which is what my preference is, right? But my preference is a weapon-mounted light, but I don't carry a weapon-mounted light because they're big and they're cumbersome, and they just, I just, I don't find a reason for me to carry a weapon-mounted light, in which case, matter of fact, this is very similar to my carry gun. That's almost exactly what my carry gun is. I carry a handheld light. I carry a compact 1911, right, with 10 rounds in the gun, 10 rounds on my side. So I use a handheld light. So the large majority of the circumstances I'm going to be in, I'll have a handheld light searching and doing whatever else I need to do. Okay. Um, 
All right, let me see what else I have. Okay, I don't see any other questions, folks. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Uh, 50 folks on this morning, didn't hit 100. I'm not sure why, but it's always the oldest school, hardcore, regular viewers that are jumping on these things, which I, I love, and I'm, I'm happy that we're on here training and talking about some things, uh, and that's probably all that, all that matters. Maybe next year uh, we'll get into the Live Fire studio and, uh, and do some cool things and get two or 300 people on here live again. I really would like that. So um, that's all I have. I know that there were some uh, girls with guns or different groups on shared by Tina and Variety and uh, Sheila and Sarah from uh, Gunsling and Mamas. There we go. Another one. If you're all on live fire, let me know. Send me a message. Reach out. We're going to do some special stuff for you all in the first of the year. So uh, keep, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, thank you all for watching. Last live stream before Christmas uh, on this beautiful year. So I hope you all have had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great Christmas and um, hopefully a happy new year too. We will do a live stream next week or we'll do a live stream next week. Maybe, maybe I'll surprise you and actually be in a different location in the live fire studio, which if you haven't checked it out, I'm telling you, it is, it is Fox News, CNN News level studio. It literally is that good with cameras and sliders meant to produce content and give a guy like me content uh, produ production capabilities that will really be impressive. So there you go. Anyways, Merry Christmas. Uh, for those of you that celebrate Christmas, hopefully most of or all of you do. Happy New Year. We'll see you next week. Not sure what we'll do. I don't know. Maybe I'll do some sort of surprise live stream. Uh, hey, Arm Women of America, New Orleans. Good morning, Stephanie. I love all these women and female groups that are getting together and training and Man, I love that. That's impressive. Incredible stuff. So, all right, folks, that's all I have. Have a great day and uh, get your light out. Get your red plastic gun. Get your light. Get a family member. Get your son. Get your daughter. Get your wife. Get your husband. Tell them to hide. Practice this stuff. I promise you, you will learn more from that. Anything. And then when you get a chance, go find a good indoor range. If you're in the Tulsa area, 2A is a fantastic range. Go to a good indoor range, turn the lights off, and work on that shooting stuff. Okay, work on these skills. So, until then, folks. Train hard.